Good afternoon and welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. I trust the weekend was fantastic. Let me start with my article which was called The Lotus Eaters and the UK Election. The United Kingdom European Union membership referendum took place in the United Kingdom and Gibraltar on 23rd June 2016. The result was 17,410,742 votes, 51.9% for leave, and 16,141,241 votes, 48.1% for remain. The pound crashed. Prime Minister David Cameron resigned by July that year. Prime Minister Theresa May stepped in but threw in the towel three years later. And now Boris Johnson is Prime Minister and leading the charge towards an election on Tuesday 12th December where Boris is seeking a decisive mandate against Jeremy Corbyn. Courage, he said, and pointed toward the land. This mounting wave will roll us shoreward soon. The Lotus Eaters is a poem by Lord Tennyson. In the Lotus Eaters, the brothers, mariners, lose themselves. There is sweet music here that softer falls than petals from blown roses on the grass, or night dews on still waters between walls. And it certainly is as if the mighty United Kingdom has lost itself in a Brexit Riviera for more than three years now, just like those mariners did in the Lotus Eaters. The cold blade of logic has been blunted by information warfare struggles. The US officer assigned to the Deputy Chief of Staff Intelligence charged with defining the future of warfare wrote, one of the defining bifurcations of the future will be, between, will be the conflict between information masters and information victims. This information warfare will not be couched in the rationale of geopolitics, the author suggests in the U.S. Army War College Quarterly, 1997, but will be spawned like any Hollywood drama out of raw emotions, hatred, jealousy and greed, emotions rather than strategy, will set the terms of information warfare struggles. So here we are, both protagonists, Boris and Jeremy, are promising heaven on earth. It would be optimistic to assume that the previously cohesive, predictable approach to legislation and policy making in the United Kingdom will return once Brexit is no longer a contentious issue. However, that is achieved, the ratings agency Moody's said. Moody said Britain's £1.8 trillion of public debt more than 80% of annual economic output, risked rising again and the economy could be more susceptible to shocks than previously assumed. Both of the main political parties have promised big spending increases ahead of next month's election. In the current political climate, Moody sees no meaningful pressure for debt-reducing fiscal policies. Moody said the increasing inertia and at times paralysis that has characterised the Brexit-era policy-making process showed how the UK's institutional framework has diminished. Moody stripped the country of its AAA rating in 2013 and downgraded it again in 2017 said it was lowering the outlook on Britain's current AA2 rating to negative from stable, meaning the rating could be cut again. 
This is a never, never land world. Boris Johnson and the Conservatives are in the lead in most of the polls and the Brexiteer Nigel Farage has seemingly stood down with no doubt promises of a peerage. Jeremy Corbyn is, however, a formidable campaigner and you will recall Theresa May was a shoo-in, supposedly. Of course, Corbyn's economic policies are a Nicolas Maduro redux and if he shuts down all the public schools, which of course are private, in a fit of peak, international money, which in fact put the great in Great Britain, will fly off in a blink of an eye. And on top of all of that, you have Donald Trump turning up a day or so before the election, just in time to give Corbyn an almighty boost, because in reality, the UK electorate see Trump as an oaf. Meanwhile, lurking behind the curtain stage left are the likes of US businesswoman Jennifer Arcuri, who has accused Boris Johnson of brutally casting her aside like some one-night stand and leaving her heart broken since he became Prime Minister and the controversy over their four-year relationship became public. I've kept your secrets and I've been your friend and I don't understand why you've blocked me and ignored me as if I was some fleeting one-night stand or some girl that you picked up at a bar because I wasn't and you know that. And I'm terribly heartbroken by the way you have cast me aside like I am some gremlin. He should know me well enough to know who I am. Shame on him for not answering the phone. The pound has risen from multi-year lows like a phoenix and has room to rally further, especially if Bojo builds a big lead. UK gilts are a sell. Everything pivots on whether there is a clean and clear outcome. It's very fluid and another hung parliament is not to be ruled out, especially if Corbyn reignites a youth quake. Johnson's Conservatives lead Labour by between 10 to 17 percentage points. Four polls published on Saturday show a YouGov poll showed support for the Conservatives stood at 45%, the highest level since 2017, compared with Labour on 28%. And basically all the other polls are showing the same thing. If you're interested in this clip, I'd be slightly afraid if I were Boris Johnson. Uh, this is the clip of, a, of an interview that Jennifer Curry has given to ITV where she says Boris Johnson cast me aside as if I were a gremlin. Apparently when she tried to call him, the phone was given to somebody who spoke to her in Chinese. Um, so clearly a volatile situation which we can't predict at all. UK 10-year gilt, this is from Trading View. I'm bearish about it, notwithstanding the, the fact that we've had a Wizard of Oz world and the global bond markets. And the pound here has risen from multi-year lows like a phoenix. We're last at 129.27, and it will rally further, particularly if Bojo goes into, it continues to trend higher. Macro thoughts, as I said on the 4th of November, I'm of the view that Bitcoin and cryptos with Jeffrey Edward Epstein and his cast of characters level con, and I called it breathtaking, um, and I said I'm having nothing to do with it other than occasionally looking in and admiring the sophistication and the level of the con because it's breathtaking. And then I saw this from Crypto Deleted. Bruce Fenton deleted this tweet after 38 minutes, basically confirming that it was a Epstein level con, but you have to make your own mind up. Currently, we're trading at 8,440, and I'm expecting it to go as low as 1,000. Very interesting book review in the New York Times, The Man Who Solved the Market by Gregory Zuckerman. Um, and uh, this is Jim Simons 
saying a former code breaker for the United States government, a brilliant mathematician, average of 39% gains over a three decade span, and that's after his company has taken a 5% management fee and 44% of the profits, speaks to combinatorial game theory and stochastic equations, a small number of macroscopic variables capable of predicting the market's short-term behavior, collected incredible amounts of historical data, not just about stocks and bonds, but about currencies, commodities, weather patterns, and all sorts of market-moving events. Um, the Lotus Eaters, which I've read to you before, but I'll just read, read the beginning. Courage, he said, and pointed toward the land. This mounting wave will roll us shoreward soon. In the afternoon they came unto a land in which it seemed always afternoon. All round the coast the languid air did swoon, breathing like one that hath a weary dream. Full-faced above the valley stood the moon, and like a downward smoke the slender stream along the cliff to fall and pause and fall did seem. And round about the keel with faces pale, dark faces pale against that rosy flame, the mild-eyed melancholy lotus eaters came. Interesting article I came across in, about the story of William Burroughs, Brion Giesin, The Dream Machine, and Von Bartha. This is an art gallery in Basel. Um, the gallery basically uh, showed very avant-garde, kinetic art. Um, at the same time, the two men found Miklos von Bartha, the gallery owner, who turned out to be the perfect individual to finally construct the dream machine with a special kind of an optical device conceptualized by Giesin. Uh, Burroughs, of course, in the mid-1940s, met Kerouac and Ginsberg in, the, in New York, became a drug addict, moved to Mexico, where he wrote his first novel, Junkie, and shot his wife, Joan Volmer. Burroughs was convicted of homicide in absentia, was given a two-year suspended sentence, then travelled through a few South American countries to explore a drug called the Age, for which he believed to provide the user telepathic abilities. Um, developed uh, Naked Lunch, um, if Burroughs was more intent on scotch taping his photos together into one great continuum on the wall, kicked his habit, um, and then basically kinetic art object is an actual cylinder made of perforated paper tube illuminated from the inside by light bulbs and placed on a turntable rotated at 78 or 45 revolutions per minute. The holes in the tube were produced according to a special pattern developed by Giesing. The observer is exposed to dream machine at eye level with their eyes closed and if the object is constructed properly, it emits light waves between 8, 8 and 13 HZ, electrical oscillations present in the human brain while relaxing. The observer experiences increasingly bright, complex patterns of colour behind their closed eyelids, an effect similar when travelling as a passenger in a car or a bus, while the patterns gradually appear shapes and symbols in a swirl. And so the dream machine achieves a sort of hypnagogic state and aims to expand one's perception Although the experience itself may be intense, one can stop it just by opening their eyes. Um, the way they search to overcome the limitations of the human mind, revolutionize the thinking process and therefore the society, makes Burroughs and Giesi an unprecedented figures in a broader context of culture and the humanities. Burroughs has famously said, a paranoid is someone who knows a little of what's going on. Paranoia is just having the right information. Hustlers of the world, there is one mark you cannot beat.
the mark inside. Desperation is the raw material of drastic change. Only those who can leave behind everything they have ever believed in can hope to escape. Language is a virus from outer space. Smash the control images, smash the control machine. The dream is a spontaneous happening and therefore dangerous to a control system set up by the non-dreamers. That took me back to here we go round the prickly pear, here we go round the prickly pear, prickly pear, prickly pear, here we go round the prickly pear at five o'clock in the morning. Many have spoken over this spring, but they were gone in the twinkling of an eye. We conquered the world with bravery and might, but we did not take it with us to the grave, said Emperor Babur in his autobiography, the Babur Nama. In 1530, Humayun, Babur's beloved eldest son and heir apparent, was stricken by a fever. Despite the best efforts of the royal physicians, his condition steadily worsened. Driven to despair, Babur consulted a man of religion who told them that the remedy was to give in arms the most valuable thing one had and to seek cure from God. Babur is said to have replied thus, I am the most valuable thing that Humayun possesses. Than me he has no better thing. I shall make myself a sacrifice for him. May God, the Creator, accept it. Humayun possessed a priceless diamond, they said, which could be sold and the proceeds given to the poor. Babur would not hear of it. What value has worldly wealth? Babur is quoted to have said. And how can it be a redemption for Humayun? I myself shall be his sacrifice. He walked three times around Humayun's bed, praying, O oh God, if a life may be exchanged for a life, I who am Babur, I give my life and my being for a Humayun. A few minutes later he cried, We have borne it away, we have borne it away. And sure enough, from that moment, Babur began to sicken, while Humayun grew slowly well. Babur died near Agra on December 21st, 1530. He left orders for his body to be buried in Kabul. A giant under giant skies taken by Chania Watts and Masai Mara. Political reflections as we sit here testify. The president is attacking you on Twitter. Representative Schiff tells Marie Jovanovic. Jovanovic said it's very intimidating. What effect do you think that has on other witnesses' willingness to come forward and expose wrongdoing? Jovanovic, it's very intimidating. What we saw today witness intimidation in real time by the President of the United States. And it was just mind-boggling. I couldn't put it down <clears throat> on Friday evening. And really, it's out of control. There's obviously nobody who can control the man. Reuters Trump advisor Roger Stone guilty on all seven counts of lying to Congress obstruction and witness tampering. I like this clip surveillance video of the Sontland Trump phone call. You've got to watch it. S. Colonel. I take you back to 31st of December when I was quoting Murphy who told the Washington Post he's trapped. He's playing poker holding two threes and suddenly putting all of his chips in. It's pure emotion. The mark of a panicking amateur. 4th of November, in my article at the moment of vision, the eyes see nothing. I was talking about this pellice verso or verso pellice, which is a Latin phrase meaning with a turned thumb that is used in the context of gladiatorial combat. It refers to the hand gesture or thumb signal used by ancient Roman crowds to pass judgment on a defeated gladiator. And I concluded, Vice President is the coming man, and this could happen real quick. Borovitz's report, which is tongue-in-cheek, everywhere she went turned bad, says man with six bankruptcies. The New Economy of Anger was an article I wrote on the 21st of October. Um, I then discovered this wonderful electronic music by Ronnie Sekaili, Revolution Radio Mix. Have a listen, it's on SoundCloud. 
and to wit, this is the scene in Chile as protesters brought down the statue of the Spanish conquistador Pedro Valdiva. It's very reminiscent of the protesters bringing down Saddam's statue all those years ago. In my article, I was quoting Paul Virilio, who wrote in his book, Speed and Politics, the revolutionary contingent attains its ideal form not in the place of production, but in the street, where for a moment it stops being a cog in the technical machine and itself becomes a motor, a machine of attack. In other words, a producer of speed. These are protests in Syria. This is an Iraq live update. As I said, the phenomenon is spreading like wildfire in large part because of the tinder dry conditions underfoot. Prolonged standoffs eviscerate economies, reducing opportunities and accelerate the negative feedback loop. This was the scene at the Hong Kong Poly University as police fired tear gas at protesters on the front line. The battle for the campus continued on Sunday. I've seen archers on the roof firing volleys of arrows at the police Gabriel Gatehouse. And there seems to have been some kind of denouement. As I said, this is a revolution and it is a global phenomenon. Tens of thousands of anti-government protesters gathered in Baghdad's <coughs> Tahrir Square. As Kapuczynski said, if the crowd disperses, goes home, does not reassemble, we say the revolution is over. And I was saying it's not over. More and more people are gathering in the streets. I've previously written about Iran on the 13th of May this year when I said what we know is this, Iran is at the Hunter S. Thompson edge. There is no honest way to explain it because the only people who really know where it is are the ones who have gone over. And I said this level of financial, coercive, sanction warfare is simply unprecedented. President Trump has been a big proponent of coercive, financial and sanction warfare and its expression vis-a-vis -vis Iran is its apogee. From Beirut to Baghdad and now in Tehran, Shiraz, Abbas and all across Iran, the earth is shaking underneath the mullahs. With these crimes, Iran protests, Iran tweeted Maryam Rajavi. But when I went through all the tweets and looked at it all, it felt very Maryam Rajavi, M.E.K. and Pompeo and a little bit manufactured. Shiraz, South Central Iran, locals chanting, Mullahs must go. That tweet is from the Mohajideen, uh, you know, this uh, Miriam Rajavi organization. So keep an eye on that, but don't get too carried away because it does look a little bit manufactured. The Xinjiang papers, absolutely no mercy, leaked files expose how China organized mass detentions of Muslims. Z call for an all-out struggle against terrorism, infiltration and separatism using the organs of dictatorship and showing absolutely no mercy. The internment camps in Xinjiang expanded rapidly after the appointment in August 2016 of Chen Quango, a zealous new party boss for the region. He distributed Mr. Z's speeches to justify the campaign and exhorted officials to round up everyone who should be rounded up. The papers were brought to light by a member of the Chinese political establishment, this is the interesting part, who requested anonymity and expressed hope that their disclosure would prevent party leaders, including Mr. Xi, from escaping culpability for the mass detention. No matter what age, anyone who has been infected by the religious extremism must undergo study. Freedom is only possible when this virus in their thinking is eradicated and they are in good health. We must be as harsh as them, he added, and show absolutely no mercy. He likened Islamic extremism alternately to a virus-like contagion and a dangerously addictive drug and declared that addressing it would, 
require a period of painful inventionary treatment. People who are captured by religious extremism, male or female, old or young, have their consciences destroyed, lose their humanity and murder without blinking an eye. He demanded an ideological cure, an effort to rewire the thinking of the region's Muslim minorities. The weapons of the people's democratic dictatorship must be wielded without any hesitation or wavering zeta of the leadership conference on Xinjiang policy, which convened six days after the deadly attack on the vegetable market. Um, this is a photograph of a restaurant in the old city of Yarkand in August. Patrons, you see a propaganda poster above them, is quoting Xi Jinping, every ethnic group must tightly bind together like the seeds of a pomegranate. Now, Zong Nanhai is leaking repeatedly these days, which is a major change from decades of Kafkaesque secrecy. This is the key point. It shows that there is certainly a power struggle to remove Z. I have written before in one, swell, one fell swoop, Z Yinping was president for life and on a pedestal. Now this is a kicking at the pedestal curve ball. As we previously said, China has unveiled a digital panopticon in Xinjiang. 21st of October, I said, unless we're going to Xinjiang, the whole world, this current modus operandi is running on empty. I also quoted the crusher of bones and his algorithmic control and how the Chinese dream has become a nightmare at the boundaries of the Han Empire. I am sure I also said Hong, Z sees Hong Kong and Taiwan like a virus and he's looking to impose a quarantine just like he has imposed on Xinjiang. Miami Herald has an interesting article saying Jeffrey Epstein wasn't trafficking women and he didn't kill himself, his brother says. He had three fractures on the left and right side of his larynx, and the chance of someone breaking three bones in their neck as a result of a low-velocity self-inflicted hanging, while not unheard of, is rare. People are calling Jeffrey a college dropout and make him out to be a really bad character, but my brother went to Cooper Union, and it's hard to get in there. He didn't drop out, he didn't need a degree, he was really good at math and he didn't let not having a degree hold him back. Remember, this is not a one-cell cockamamie prison. This is a federal prison in downtown New York that housed John Gotti, El Chapo. To accept all these as facts is unbelievable. 19th of August, I said, Epstein had a collection of eyeballs on his wall. He was, in the words of the New York Times, not closely monitored. Epstein was a spy in a society of spies. It was a collector in a collector's economy. He was a watcher and he died allegedly while nobody was watching. I was at Pizza Express on the night in question, says Prince Andrew. Fantastic uh, selection of tweets from Man Integrated uh, about the Indian Ocean control of key land masses that enables logistical operations at scale. The U.S. is one of the most important, China wants it, and this is Diego Garcia. Um, it's a unique installation uh, and saying that this is giving the U.S. and the U.K. an advantage for China to achieve hegemony in the Indian Ocean region and secure the string of pearls. It must box out the U.S. Navy's superior force projection capabilities. But Diego Garcia complicates things. It's an unsinkable aircraft carrier. Quoting Zinia News Agency reporting on the completion of the Bagatelle Dam in Mauritius, critical scalp, he says, um, uh, abandoning their previous sponsor, the UK, Mauritius aligned with China. And I take it back to, um, well, and then he says, even more interesting, the announcement China's first ever trade agreement with an African nation, <coughs> the beneficiary of this unprecedented treatment, Mauritius a tiny island with a GDP of $14.3 billion. August 2013, I said, I have no doubt that the Indian Ocean is set to regain its glory days. I quoted Andrew Corribico, who said the Indian Ocean region is expected to become the geostrategic center of gravity in the new Cold War. Uh, August 2018, I was writing about the Indian Ocean and uh, Port Race. 
uh, quoting uh, Rear Admiral Alfred Teus Mahan, whoever attains maritime supremacy in the Indian Ocean would be a prominent player on the international scene. I take you back to FOCAC, where in the keynote speech by Xi Jinping, the ocean is vast because it rejects no rivers. He also uh, forgave debts for small island developing countries that have diplomatic relations with China, showing you the importance of these islands and the geopolitical topography. Move on, bond markets, fate hangs in the balance before trade war crunch. Um, this is where we saw this uh, humongous Wizard of Oz rally. We saw a little bit of a backup, but we've now started to see an improvement again. Keep an eye, look at this chart, you can see the trend in front of you. Let's move on to the currency markets. Euro dollar 110.65, dollar index 97.93, Japanese yen 108.83, Swiss franc 0.9903, the pound that's moved up 129.46, the Australian dollar 0.6815, India rupee 71.7242, South Korean 111,6360, .60. the Rial 4,1954, Egyptian pound 16,1152, and the Rand 14,1735. Dollar index chart, I still think we're going to see a weaker dollar going forward. Euro dollar, this is a make or break kind of level, and I think we're headed above 111. Gold 14,6575. Uh, crude oil, about which I was bullish a few weeks ago, very strong session on Friday, rising 1.7% to the close at the highest in September 23rd, currently at 57.81. I think today we'll see a bit of a, a weaker day, and then we'll resume the rally, uh, headed up to 60. Crude has gained more than 10% since early October. Um, and oil short sellers have slashed their various bearish positions. John Alphers on Friday in his really fantastic email speaking about the emerging world, he said all the main sources of liquidity have seen a decline this year. Have a look at this. This is led by central banks, but there have also been declines in foreign inflows of cash and in private sector flows. Hopes were widespread that the PBOC would turn on the tap and try to stimulate China's economy. The exact opposite has happened, as illustrated by this chart from cross-border capital. I wrote about this in an article called The Feedback Loop Phenomenon. I said China has exerted the power of pull over a vast swathe of the world over the last two decades. We can call it the China, Asia, EM, and frontier markets feedback loop. This feedback loop has been largely a positive one for the last two decades, with the one which was in retreat at that time in precise response to Trump, but nevertheless a slowing China as it will surely exert serious downside pressure on those countries in the feedback loop. I said the purest proxy for the China, Asia, EM and frontier markets feedback loop phenomenon is the South African rand. And I also said the most important currency to watch is the renminbi, currently at 7.0150. Uh, China's economy is unambiguously slowing down, as you can see, and JP Morgan Chase's widely used index of emerging market foreign exchange is close to plumbing a new low. More than that, latest IIF data show why this is such a concern. The amount of dollar-denominated debt issued in emerging markets has shot up in recent years. This is a further issue. The emerging market FX debt, that's again from John Arthurs. Russia's shadow presence in Africa, Wagner Group mercenaries in at least 20 countries aim to turn continent into strategic hub. This is the Daily Maverick. The godfather and funder of Wagner Group is Yevgeny Prigozhin, a St. Petersburg-based oligarch known as Putin's chef, who has led Russia's push into Africa over the past three years, moving into a vacuum left in part by the United States' is waning interest in the continent. A former KGB operative, now based in the West, <coughs> Described Wagner's meteoric rise in Africa as one of the most successful GRU, Russian military intelligence, operations of all times. 
documents showed the company taking credit for the election of Madagascar's new president, Andrew Rajolina, and that Russia produced and distributed the island's biggest newspaper. Two new companies, Patriot and Sioux Security Services, have begun operations in Africa during the past year. Um, talking about a chap called Udkins, Nom de Guerre's Wagner, allegedly due to his affection for the attributes and ideology of Adolf Hitler's nationalist socialist regime and its beloved composer, Wagner. At other times, Wagner's funded itself by deals with the foreign governments in the CAR, compensated for training the presidential guard and receives a percentage of profits from the gold and diamond mines it guards. From what can be gleaned from sources on the ground and the scant open information that is available, Wagner is present in at least 20 African countries. On 31st of October, Facebook suspended three networks of Russian accounts tied to Prigozhin that it claimed were influencing operations hiding behind fake identities that had meddled in the domestic politics of eight African countries, CAR, Congo, Brazzaville, Sudan, Mozambique, Madagascar, Cameroon, and Ivory Coast. Though U.S. Africa Command maintains one of the largest drone complexes in the world in Djibouti and has built a new complex in Agadez in Niger, the U.S. under Trump has demonstrated little enthusiasm for Africa. Wagner's rationale for its operations in Africa is that it is helping defeat terrorists, Islamist insurgents, and transnational criminals that are destabilizing the continent. What differentiates Wagner and makes him so valuable is their willingness to fight on the front lines. Wagner's forces are fighting in Mali, Libya, CAR, South Sudan, and Sudan. Unconformed reports of more than 1,000 mercenaries in Congo Brazzaville and 2,700 troops stationed on Russian warships off the coast of Mozambique. Wagner's ability to come on the back of Russian military agreements has given it an extraordinary reach. Unofficially, Wagner personnel are in more than 20 African countries, the number that is growing. Original diamond dogs of war, like the PMC executive outcomes, in trading military support for mining deals, especially when the host country can't afford the bills. Like EO troops or veterans of Southern Africa's wars, many of Wagner's fighters are battle-hardened veterans of the Chechen wars and now Ukraine and Syria. Wagner can do things that the Russian military cannot as it operates in a world of smokes and mirrors. Shadow wars are a certain type of war where plausible deniability eclipses firepower in terms of effectiveness. Think about how Russia was in Crimea in older war tactics when they would put their heel on another state and send in the tanks. Now in 2019 that's not how they do it. They have military backup, they use covert and clandestine means. Uh, they use special forces, mercenaries, proxies, propaganda, things that give them plausible deniability. They manufacture the fog of war and then exploit it for victory. In Cameroon, Wagner's advising the battle against Boko Haram. Angola purchased expensive Sukhoi Su-30 fighter jets. 200 Wagner men are involved in protecting Russian military officials at the Pico Basile Island spy base in Equatorial Guinea. So far, Russia's military scramble for Africa has happened on the cheap. Chinese, Chinese military operations Tenka for Gurume and the DR Congo are protected by American mercenary Eric Prince's Frontier Services Group. I touched on this in an article called From Russia with Love, and I said I would argue Putin's timing is exquisite and optimal, and his model has an exponential ROI. Um, I was quoting Andrew Corribico, who was talking about Moscow filling the much-needed niche of providing its partners with democratic security, or in other words, the cost-effective, low-commitment capabilities needed to thwart color revolutions and resolve unconventional wars. To simplify, Russia's political technologists have reportedly devised bespoke solutions for confronting incipient and ongoing color revolutions. I said Z is fed up and speaks about the end of vanity because the ROI outside commodities and telecoms for China is negative. Putin has created a hybrid model with an exponential ROI. I would imagine he's on speed dial. Big Saturday, read two years after the coup, the economy. This is Mama Gaisa. For all the shortcomings of his two-year-old administration, Mama Gaga might have been excused by many Zimbabweans and might have been glorified as a hero had he performed a Houdini act on the economy. 
He touted it as the new dispensation, promised to do things differently from the old regime. It has been a much ado about nothing affair. Talks about the budget, borrowing speed spree from the central bank over our facility, the RBZ rose from $1.4 billion in December 2017 to $2.5 billion in September 2018. Um, and then saying enormous foreign debt that's still there, which is $8 billion. Manangagwa regime might have used the goodwill and support it enjoyed in the early months to find a benefactor willing to support it with bridge financing to clear its arrears and unlock credit lines that could have provided a huge boost. That's how Myanmar was able to clear about $6 billion of its debts in 2013 with the help of Japan. Manangagwa regime did not have the fortune of its counterparts in Myanmar. It is clear uh, it is not clear why none of the regime's allies came to its aid. For so long referred by ZANU PF as an all weather friend, China has balked at the request for $2 billion of support. Not even China had confidence in the new regime, despite the rhetoric. It had refused Mugabe's requests a few years earlier. Talks about the collapse in the local currency. Um, and then it's a really interesting article worth reading in full. Uh, going into all the different dynamics of the economy. As I said on the 21st of June, Zimbabwe is at a tipping point moment. The choice of that moment is the greatest riddle of history, of course. The mind game that ZANU PF had played on its citizens has evaporated in a puff of smoke. I spoke in October 2018 about the government's voodoo economics, where it spent $1.3 billion pump priming the economy ahead of the election money it did not have. And I said that was the score that broke the camel's back. 9th of September, when Manangagwa was eulogizing Mugabe as a revolutionary icon, I said he's failed and is frankly as untenable as his erstwhile mentor. I was talking about the correlation between high inflation and revolutionary conditions, and I was quoting Yuval Harari, who said money is accordingly a system of mutual trust, and not just any system of mutual trust, it is the most universal and most efficient system of mutual trust ever devised. And I said Zimbabwe is a laboratory experiment with inflation at that time clocking 176% and it's now clocking about 500%. Listen to this, what's the price of a loaf of bread? And the Minister, Minister of Finance responds, it is whatever it is. So South African all share up 6.29% year to date, dollar rand at 14.70. Egyptian pound 16.12, EGX 30 up 11.66% year to date, Nigerian all share down 14.57% year to date, Ghana Stock Exchange down 13.92% year to date, Uganda resubmits the China loan request for $2.3 billion railway. Um, government, uh, the project cost was cut by $26 million. The initial loan request, listen to this, was delayed after the lender sought a comprehensive feasibility study. They go to borrow $2.3 billion without a feasibility study. It's just mind-boggling. There is no way he's going to give them the money. As I said, he spoke of the end of vanity, which at the time I characterized as the substantive linguistic recasting of China, Africa by Xi Jinping. And he said that a folk act, vanity of vanities, as the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Uh, Huawei's pitch to African mayors, our cameras will make you safe. In Shenzhen, there are about 2 million video cameras in one city. The population is about 20 million. It's not only the camera, but also the artificial intelligence behind it on the clouds. So everybody in Shenzhen city, you have any behavior, it could be recorded. Um, Liu, a senior marketing executive at Huawei, is in Mombasa at an exclusive gathering of African mayors and local government officials. It is a vision that revolves around surveillance, artificial intelligence, 5G, creating a world where every movement is tracked, recorded, and searchable. Smart water meters, smart electricity meters, smart street lighting, smart traffic monitoring, all underpinned by cloud computing that brings all the data together on a single platform, seamlessly managed by artificial intelligence. Abraham cites the example of one town in Kenya, I'd like to know which one, where Huawei launched a trial project installing high-definition surveillance cameras and training police to use it. The crime level was lowered by 46%, he says. 
when asked neither Lee nor Abraham to tell the men of God in the name of the Kenyan town in question. Human Rights Watch describes this technology as algorithms of repression. Um, and this, then talking about uh, Xinjiang, uh, of course. Uh, African countries, an especially relevant example is Ecuador, an early adopter of the smart cities technology in 2011. Uh, countries fear domestic intelligence agency was picking up all this kind of data. You want to get the perpetrator, but he's wearing a mask. How are you going to get him? He asked. These recognition algorithms check what clothes you're wearing, what shoes are on your feet, checks your gait, because everybody's gait is unique. They think it's just fingerprints or retina, but everybody has a unique gait. All those algorithms are working together to identify you. The nice part of it is that your past now catches up with you. They can take a side image of you and render your whole face and run it through the camera system, and they will know where you were for the last two weeks which mall, where you were, what car you were driving, who's always with you at the mall. They do all those associations through artificial intelligence. Human beings can't process that amount of data. And then H.E. Bobby Wine, among the things I got to learn as they were listening to my calls, following my location. I even learned that day when I was arrested and brutalized, it was because they were tracking me. Boris Johnson at Unger spoke of, spoke of smart cities which will accumulate with sensors. Um, all joined together by the Internet of Things, bollards communing invisibly with lampposts and asked, how do you plead with an algorithm? Harmonization pushed up intra-African trade, EAC trade, by over 10% uh, to $3.2 billion last year. Kenya's debt-to-GDP ratio is on course to hit 61.6% .6 at the end of this year. Rwanda is expected to touch 49.1%. Uganda and Tanzania will increase to 43.6 and 37.7. Um, according to David and Dee, the government crowded out the private sector and now accounts for 40% of growth, hence the tax base is shrinking. Private investment contribution to GDP is now negative, he's saying. 91-day T-bill rate is at 6.7%, 182-day T-bill at 7.8%, 364-day T-bill at 9.8%. 2018 issued 10-year euro bonds at 6.3%, 30-year euro bond at 7.8%. 2019 issued 7-year euro bond at 6.1%, 12-year euro bond at 7.2%. Diaspora remittances have increased cumulatively by 8% in the 12 months to September 2019 to $2.8 billion. That's what's underpinning the shilling. The NSE trades on a price earnings ratio of 12.1 and a dividend yield of 6.7. NSC listed insurance companies are trading at a price to book of 0.8, lower than listed banks at 1.2. That's according to Cyton. Thank you for listening. Much appreciated.